What is going on guys? My name is Hussein and in this video I want to discuss the difference between cross-site request forgery and server-side request forgery. Uh, how about we jump into it guys? So I'm gonna start with cross-site request forgery. So think about this way guys. Cross-site request for forgery happened usually at the client side the forgery happened at the client side, all right? So that's how I remember it, right? And what we do is assume we have an application here. This is the browser and uh, we're kind of authenticated to my website, let's say uh, example.com. I'm already authenticated and this is example.com, right? I'm already authenticated and I have, let's say I have a cookie here that has this authentication, right? And uh, let's assume it's not the same site cookie because <laughs> that actually solves the problem, right? But yeah, I have this uh, uh, this cookie that essentially authenticate me. So if I'm if I'm a, if I click a button that says get I don't know orders, right? I'm gonna make a request, and since the HTTP protocol is stateless, it's gonna send all the time. It's gonna send the cookie header, right? I'm gonna send the cookie here. And that's how the server actually recognized me. The cross-site request forgery is the ability of a completely different site here, evil.com, right? Having the ability to send a request on your behalf while sending also the cookie, right? So somehow this website, which is the evil.com, have managed to got, get, get your cookie. And when it does that, you can, the site can actually make request on your behalf, right? So this could happen even by even uh, just clicking a link, going to that web page. And that website, when it makes a request to example.com, if the browser was dumb enough to send that cookie, and we know cases where this is actually possible, right? We need, for example, if the same site cookie is none, then we always gonna send that cookie, right? We talked about same site, go check that video out right here. But yeah, cross-site request forgery can happen as a result. This is one example. Another example is XSS, right? A cross-site scripting, is that how you spell it? Yes, cross-site scripting, right? So I am, this is even more dangerous, right? So cross-site scripting can allow the user to inject code into your application, right? And when you, when I, as a bad actor, I inject code into the application, I can make request on your behalf in the application and even the same site property for the cookie will not protect you. That's cross-site scripting is the worst, right? That's why we have to sanitize input. You have to do all that stuff here, right? So yeah, cross-site scripting or that can lead to cross-site request forgery. So the attacker is forging a request. So technically you didn't make that request, right? This request is evil, but someone else made that request on your, on your behalf. They forged the request and it happened completely at the client side. That's how I remember it, cross-site request forgery. So it's a cross-site. Well, it can happen in the same site as well if you injected some XSS and you sent some results here and, and posted the output somewhere else. You might say, what, what's wrong with making a get request to get an order? Well, this site can get the request and and display the orders in their website and then save it to disk, right? And then, uh, not really save it to disk because it, it's your disk, right? But yes, it, save, uh, it can have the information locally and then upload it later to their evil.com website. All right, guys, so that's the cross-site request forgery real quick. All right, guys, uh, server-side request forgery is, is one of those names that I believe they are given name for the sake of just having a name, to be honest. I I don't think they deserve a name, but sure, since we name everything on the web, let's, let's name this attack too. So server-side request forgery is the ability of the forgery is happening on the server side. So let's, let's explain what that means. So let's assume you are a client here, not necessarily a web server or a web browser, it's just a client and uh, we're making a request. 
And the API here, that API that you make a request to, actually the server is, is designed to make another API to other servers, right? Let's say this is another server, all right? So this is the API. Let's say this is not a database, right? Let's say this is another API server that happens to, I don't know, check the prices or something, right? So that to make this get request successful, the server take that get request and makes another call to another API. This is how microservices does all the job most of the time. Some implementation, if, if you have implemented this in a way such that you actually specify the API, the backend API as part of your body or part of the URL, even get request or post request, let's say, let's say this says HTTP at price.com, right? This is the API, whatever, api.price.com. And this is the, the server of the price.com API, right? That's the server. So what do you do is like, hey, I'm gonna, I want all the products right? And here's the API for the price, right? I have no idea why you would you do something like that. That's bad practice in general. But some APIs does that, right? They actually, may, for flexibility reason, you, you can specify your own API if you want to, what API endpoint you want to use. If you want to do that, never actually specify the URL. That's the problem. And we're going to explain why in a second. So what, what happened here? I'm making a st list of all the products. And the server will say, okay, I have the products right here because I am in local database. But to get the prices of the product, I need to call in the price.api product, get that result, cache the result, and then response with everything to the client. So what's wrong with this, Hussein? So here's, here's the problem, right? Since you gave me a big hole right here, I can specify anything right here, right? I can specify HTTP. I want you to go, I want you to make a call to localhost slash admin, right? Or 12700 slash admin. And what the heck is localhost? If you make a request localhost right here, it's gonna fail because you you don't have anything running, right? However, if you do like slash admin, localhost slash admin, and guess what? The server happened to have and a web server running and it's running localhost admin endpoint. Guess what? The server will make a request to itself, right? as admin and who is better to be trusted than the server itself. So it's gonna make a request to the admin if that admin uh, endpoint exists. And guess what? It's gonna return all the content, right? Because you don't have to log in because you're admin, you're literally in the admin space, right? That's one way of doing. So so what happened here, the server is doing the forgery, right? This It's a server side forgery, request forgery. So. We're making a legit request as far as we are concerned, right? However, the server is making that forgery, right? The th forgery happening on the server side, right? It's, it's purely a bug at the server side, right? Because we're allowing that. So another thing we can do is I can, for example, allow HTTP slash slash what? Uh, another website or server that only the server have access to, right? I don't know, some other services here that is private to this resource, right? And you can just make a request and pull that information. FTP perhaps, right? Pull an FTP service and pull some local resources if there is an FTP service running around. So you can make requests on behalf of the server and that's extremely dangerous. You can go all the way and if you get, obviously you get to get the admin result or get the FTP result. You can go all the way also and make a DDoS attacks. If you own many of these requests, you can <laughs> you can essentially DDoS a, a poor slop right here, a server that is just completely normal and make a request. 
so that the server makes that request to the ser to that uh, third party service that you want to take down instead of you so that's another way where server side request forgery also uh, can take uh, effect right so in a short guys summary all right so quick summary guys cross-site request forgery the forgery happening at the client side you are as as an as a bad user you are making you are hijacking an authenticated user an already authenticated user request and making a request on on their behalf so you're making it at the cross side at a client side right the server side you are just a normal you are the bad guy and you are connecting to the server as the bad guy right and you are making a request and forging the request at the server side right so you don't really at the server side request forgery is more dangerous because you don't really care about cookies or anything you don't need anyone authenticated you can do it yourself as a bad user as a bad hacker right you can just hit the server immediately and just do the bad stuff immediately with a cross-site request forgery no you're hijacking an existing user uh, login right you're sending a user someone and says hey user go ahead and uh, click on this link in emails right for example and and this way they you can um, do a cross-site request forgery well the server side is like so back in engineers guys you have to watch out for this front-end engineers you have to watch us for this right this is for back-end engineers this is for front-end engineers right so back-end engineers make good apis De never never let the client specify a url always specify i don't know some sort of a lookup right it says okay the pro price api and then look it up at the back end if it's not supported return an error never allow your apis to expose a uh, essentially just plain urls all of all, all, just like that plain sir. so yeah so server side versus client side guys hope you enjoyed this video very quick i'm gonna see you on the next one you guys stay awesome goodbye check out the other content in this channel i appreciate all the love and subscription guys goodbye stay awesome